My name is uh, Derek George. Uh, I am uh, part of a member of the Developmental Disabilities Council uh, and also uh, a former uh, business owner and network administrator uh, for Delaware Computer Mechanics. Now that is debunked, now I just do freelance. So that's me, I'm a small business owner. So tell us a little bit about your childhood. Um, from from childhood, uh, I, I've always been a real uh, inquisitive, uh, ornery individual. When when all the other kids uh, were were outside playing sports and they were outside being active, uh, I kind of defaulted to using my brain more or less and, and going in. And I've always had a real big knack for computers, a real big knack for cameras and video. So a lot of my time was spent inside you know, taking things apart, seeing how they work, putting things back together, um, building computers. I built my first computer when I was like seven years old. Um, used to build websites for free. Used to shoot movies on 16 millimeters. So, you know, when I didn't have the physical acumen because of the disability to go out and, you know, do those things and engage myself in the community, I just stayed in and, and kept to myself a lot. Um, however, that it always taught me to be a, brought me on to be a very observant individual. I was always uh, watching people's interactions with one another, how they responded to me in social situations as well as private. And, you know, I was always v very aware of everything and um, always tried to be good and open with people, um, always tried to be patient with individuals and, you know, and just kind of use that as a stepping stone to, to get people to know that. You know, a lot of us out there with disabilities, we, we, there, there's, you know, wide-ranging severities of even my disability, which is cerebral palsy. Um, and I've been blessed with enough cognitive function to be out there in the community and speak to people in a way to where we can all be respected and all looked at as contributing individuals. Uh, I feel that is sometimes uh, a, a long forgotten thing, you know, we, we were, we're all looked at as a lesser individual because of our uh, physical impairments and that shouldn't be the case. So did you live here? Where did you live? Um, I've, I've lived um, in this, in Newark my entire life. I've, li I've, I've lived in Newark my entire life. Um, lived in um, Devon Bins. And I'm a Newark High School graduate. Um, I lived upon graduation. I moved to Florida, um, and I majored in film and TV production at Full Sail. Lived on my own for two years, um, just kind of you know getting hitting the ground running, you know, learn how to learn how to pay bills, getting out, being independent, um, meeting new people. That really kind of broke me out of my shell socially. As a young man, I was very introverted. Um, I, I dealt with a lot of weight issues as a kid um, and, and very, just very secluded um, in, my, in my mind and my thoughts and never, never really was depressed per se. I, I would always try to look at the best and, and take everything, the good and the bad, as a learning experience. You always learn the most from the bad, from the bad I, I believe. Um, lived in Florida through many ups and downs for three and a half years. Graduated from Full Sail and, and did some uh, computer science work independently. Uh, upon graduating, I moved back to Newark, where we are now, and uh, started a business with a friend of mine from high school, um, along with doing freelance IT work and doing some uh, some weddings, shooting some wedding videography in my spare time. So you always wanted to be in computers and film, right? Yeah, computers and film are my first loves, you know. Like I said, um, I've, now granted, I love sports. I love, you know, I love going out and going to the bars and having fun and, and getting into and that camaraderie of sports and what sports teach you, teaches you as a leader, but not not having the physical abilities, I uh, just kind of reverted to movies and and music and computers and technology and and tinkering with things. I always had a good eye. 
um, good eye for troubleshooting, a good eye for people. I, I just have a, a, a good a good detector, um, and it's been a very been a been a very been very blessed to to be able to uh, work through these things and and learn learn from them. Um, but I've always loved um, computers and film. When I got my first one, uh, well, when I, I actually built my first computer, um, and I built that back in 1999, so I was eight, almost nine years old, um, and just kind of learned from spare parts around around the house. Uh, my uncle gave me a bunch of, uh, gave me a computer case, gave me a power supply, gave me motherboard. Gave me a uh, you know CD burner and gave me some software and said, hey, play with it, see what you come up with. And I started tinkering with things and learning how things worked and and you know learning the different areas of of just building a building a machine um, and and how all of the parts integrate into each other and, and work together. Uh, that was something that always interests me um, and. Uh, not only that, uh, computers, but I've always been into films. I've always had a very analytical sense. I always, you know, I, I say this all the time because of how much I love movies. I hate people that talk during movies. Uh, so I like to say, yeah, I'm not one of those talkers, but I am always subconsciously uh, questioning why a certain shot was done, why a certain character acted the way they did, or a motive, or maybe a shot or a lighting situation. I would always kind of question that, and I always kind—I just—I overanalyze things by default. Uh, that is, that is a good thing, and that is also a negative at times. It leads to stress. It leads to stress in the workplace sometimes. But um, from just, from just, you know, having a genuine love for things and a genuine love for information and never taking anything for face value and, and always questioning everything. Uh, movies and movies and computers just always, always uh, taught me keep questioning, never give up, something's wrong, hey, well, we, you can figure it out, you just haven't figured it out yet. Um, so it kind of helped me, uh, taught me a little bit of weird discipline at the same time. Oh, here's a personal question. Did you date people? Do you? Mm. Do I? Um, really? Uh, as I as I had mentioned earlier, um, as a young young kid, um, I I dealt with uh, a lot of weight weight issues. At one time, being almost 300 pounds, being you know 300 pounds, four foot eleven. My nickname was the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, and me being a Ghostbusters movie guy. And having a good sense of humor, like I always had, I, I would uh, take that and run with it. I took it as a compliment. And if you wanted to pick on me or pick on somebody else with a disability, I always told those people, "Hey, man, you never know what that other person's going through. There's a reason why uh, they're doing that." And that, my weight, along with just me being me being an introvert, um, yeah, I had a lot of girlfriends over the years on and off, uh, friends, relationships, but nothing that was ever serious. And, and me being aware in social situations and, and seeing the way that people, be, seeing the way that people look at me, women, whatever, and their body language towards people with individuals, there's, there's still a barrier that hasn't been broken yet. And even me, uh, with enough, you know, like I said, with enough awareness and, and kind of function to be able to discern between you know good body language and bad body language, I know uh, I can definitely tell how people uh, feel towards me, and I always try to break that ice by either making a joke about myself, uh, you know, all self-deprecating humor kind of gets me in the door. So, and that that has led me to have a lot of good friendships over the years that I still have to this day. Um, now, granted, do I want relationship I think well, hey like we all do hey women are hers you know women are fun it's a great thing you know I, I 
would love to have something, but that it all comes in time, you know. Um, something I, I've I've always wanted a connection with someone, you know, and for them to look past the disability. But sometimes it's just hard, you know. Activities of daily living, from showering to to dressing to any anything, which are showering and dressing are my two main issues. Uh, that's a big hurdle uh, to jump over for a lot of people. Even friends that I've made um, that are now very good friends of mine had trouble with that at first. So if your friends are going to have trouble with it, a woman's definitely going to have trouble with it. So it's always put a damper on relationships, but hey, that's just part of life and hey, that, that kind of comes secondary. Uh, I'm glad I'm here and I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to advocate for people that are in my situation that feel the same way as I do but cannot verbally communicate their their feelings and their thoughts and their opinions and I feel as though I can be there for them as an advocate to help them to relate to them to let people know that I know what they're going through and when people tell them no or when people try to shut them down I can be there to 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 relate and try to break those barriers so where, where do you live now, and who else lives here, and do you wish you could live someplace else, or do you want to stay? I live, um, I live by the University of Delaware campus, right off of Elton Road. I've, like I said, I've, other than my uh, time in Florida for school, which my brother uh, came down and took care of me, I'm very grateful for that. Um, it just helped with my independence. I've been here my entire life. I live with my uh, with my two brothers. I'm, I'm the youngest. I'm the th I'm the third child, and I live with my mother. And we we just you know we we uh, we help each other out. We look out for each other. And yeah, it may not be the best. And hey, I got a temper, and we all have tempers, and we all argue just like any other family would. But we try to, you know, always be there and look out for each other. Even if we can't stand one another, we're, we're still very supportive of one another. And I know that, you know, if I need them for, for things, whether it's a shower or, or a ride somewhere to get to and from therapy, um, they're there. As I get older, um, I, I've been desiring more of a relationship uh, and just, you know, more, more freedom and independence. For, uh, Living in Florida and living on my own really taught me uh, how much can be gained from just sheer independence and, and being on your own and living with roommates and being there. But I kind of lucked into a situation down there where I had friends and I had a network of people down there that I already knew. So I was comfortable. A uh, big thing with me is, you know, going in, going into a living situation and not knowing these people and then having that disability uh, act as like a compounding factor is like a big surprise. Uh, you know, it goes back to having the roommates and being in cluttered spaces and, and just, you know, me having to take showers, me doing all this stuff. It's, it's, very, uh, it's very imposing upon, upon certain groups of people. And, and living in Florida and having, having that structure uh, really helped me gain some discipline. Um, I'm actually in the process of possibly moving out. I'm looking at a couple places. Um, and that is the eventual goal in the short term is to try to um, move out, um, move into Pennsylvania uh, right over the line and, and try, to, try to start a life where it's just kind of me. and and build off of it and have friends that will help help me on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm lucky. Um, I have a good core group of friends. I don't really break out of my box. If I've known you and I let you in, I've known you for a while. You got to pass my test, you know. I got to see where your head's at. And I'm luckily, lucky to have a good group of friends that if I were to call them at the drop of a hat and things hit the fan and I needed help, whether it's a ride to therapy or a ride to an interview, if, if they're not working, uh, they will, they would do anything for me. Uh, so, you know, and so would my brothers, you know, it's like 
But if none of them are available, I have a, a good group of friends that would step up to the plate. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, that eventually maybe one of them could move out there with me and help me get situated and help me get, you know, help me get accustomed to a new life. But I definitely, definitely want to move out. That is definitely in the, in the, in the goals, in the picture. I'm 27. I'm 20, 27. I'm I'm young, but uh, I'm just uh, I've you know I got that first taste of living on my own. Did well. It was a great experience. It taught me more than I could ever ever really learn on my own. Um, and it's just something that. I'll never forget, and I need to get back to that. It was a good time. It was a good time in my life. It was a great learning experience. It helped me socially. It helped me break out of my cell, sh shell. It helped me break out of my shell socially, um, as well as kind of physically. Um, I, I lost a lot of weight. Uh, as I became more social, I wasn't, uh, I was still aware uh, you know, subconsciously, I'm still very analytical. I would still question people all the time. I would still, you know, I still had that same analytical uh, sense, but I, I, I was able to relax and was able to open up in ways that I wouldn't if I never had the chance to live independently. Yeah. So what are you doing these days? As of right now, uh, I'm currently unemployed. I'm doing a little bit of freelance IT work on the side, as well as website d design um, through through forums. Just kind of pick up work, um, just kind of hustling, just kind of keeping my nose n nose to grind, and uh, eventually want to go back to school and uh, get my master's in uh, computer science. Uh, hopefully, going to apply at University of Delaware. So, we'll see we'll see how that goes. Advocacy work you do now. Um, as far as uh, my av advocacy work, uh, I just got appointed about two months ago. Uh, now, granted, I've been going to I've been going to meetings way longer than that, um, but I, I'm part of the adult. Uh, <laughs> I'm a part of the Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, uh, granted, that is not really along the lines of what I have. I don't necessarily have a developmental disability. I would say I only have a physical disability. Cerebral palsy is a physical disability. Uh, we're working on a couple RFPs for Alzheimer's and dementia patients to kind of get some advocacy and get some awareness out there um, about um, proper care uh, for these individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia. I am also a part of the Adults and Aging with Physical Disabilities Council, which is right along there with what I got going on being an adult and an aging adult with a physical disability uh, of cerebral palsy. Um, but uh, I was brought on by a friend of mine um, who I used to play, uh, I used to play uh, challenger baseball with her daughter Bridget, my friend uh, Terry Hancherick. I've been fr I've been friends with Bridget for years. Um, they actually lived in our neighborhood here, um, and that's how I kind of brought up you know this whole advocacy thing came about. Was uh, she had always told me how articulate I was and how well spoken I was, and and how much I genuinely care about the other people in my position, which I do because we're all the same, man. We just can't communicate and articulate the thoughts like some of some of the rest of us. So I want to be there for those other those other people that I know feel the same way as I do, want the same freedoms and the same independence that I do, and and can't advocate and can't tell people just to leave them alone or give them their space, you know, because we're you know I'm just like the rest of you. I like my space. I like my quiet time. I like to just be isolated sometimes. I like to throw the headphones on and listen to music. I like to just, you know, tell you, you know, just be, be in my own thoughts, and, and so do they. They just can't, they, they can't tell you, and so that's what drew me to the advocacy was to, to be that voice uh, for individuals like me, who, who can't necessarily have a voice. You know, if anybody from Delaware went down to D.C. in that recent protest, 
Which one? Which protest? Because I. Oh yeah, um, my buddy from Florida did. My my friend, uh, my friend uh, Kurt, pretty heavy down there um, in the Orlando area, and he actually flew up to D.C. for the rally. He's a his mother's old hippie, so I feel like you know all of us with o older uh, older parents from the baby boomer generation, we're just all taught to you know not not take anything and not take anything for face value and always ask questions and, and you know nothing is really right you know the, between the current political landscape and all this racism that's going on and all this hostility uh, it's just it's just all this hatred isn't just for all this hatred and disdain isn't just for the you know for the white or the black individual blue orange I don't care what color you are we're all the same we we all made you know we were all made the same way. We were all taught to be better than that, and really you know, there's just a we're just a society full of ignorant people. Uh, you're not only ignorant about you know what's going on, policies and all that, but you're also ignorant about <laughs> different different people from different walks of life, disability community being one of them. Uh, so there's, you know, there's this ignorance on the, on the state level from from legislative hall um, to kind of pigeonhole us all into one one class and and you know try to put us in homes and and try to push us along and there's no there's no oversight there there's nothing you know there's no input there's no inclusion from the disability community themselves and I feel like you know that. Me, uh, me joining the uh, me joining the council and multiple councils uh, I hope to be one of those first people that can be in legislative hall and when they're trying to take away you know people with CP's benefits people with spina bifida and they're trying to say you well, well people with CP can't walk they can't drive a car they can't have kids they can't be contributing members of society yeah uh, I'm here to tell you they can, okay? And for you to think that, that's where that ignorance, ignorance starts. Every, every case, every person with a disability sh should be approached on a case-by-case -case basis, meaning you shouldn't have this preconceived notion about a person with a disability. You need to, you need to go and meet them and talk to them and, and see what really drives them instead of you know, just putting us under this class and sticking us to sticking us in this class system and keeping us there. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, things going on that you know we all have our opinions on, and we we can articulate our opinions. And especially when it comes to our needs, I'm sorry to tell you, but the best person the best person to ask about what they need is an articulate individual like myself and others that I've met on the council um, that, you know, they know exactly what they need, they know their limitations, uh, they know what, what, what they're good at, uh, what, what they can do well independently, they know what they can do better, what, what they can get better at. And it's all about just keeping an open line of dialogue. There's not uh, enough of an open line of dialogue between at personal advocates, self-advocates like myself in the disability in, in community and then input at, at the state level at legislative hall on how to make better community-based services what's needed down to PT you know if, if you know I good example is I can't even go um, I can't even go now uh, to get uh, another uh, another walker or another um, assistive device without going through months and months of of paperwork and, and time consuming things when people there should be an oversight committee of some sort that is only comprised of self advocates or parents, you know, first relatives, close people that know, that have been down those paths, that know what they need and, and can really say, All right, we need to, to bring this case to review or we need to have a session bring a bunch of cases to review and then take the input from self-advocates and parents on how to provide better community-based services because it's not out there 
from from you know being protected uh, on an educational level. You know, we've come a long way, um, even even from past 15 years, just in terms of how IEPs have been implemented um, for education and accessibility and following the ADA Act and all that. But there's still a lot of there's still a lot of room to grow, and we can't become complacent. You can't become stagnant. You got to keep you got to keep knocking those doors down. Somebody tells you no, you can't do this. You ask them. You say why? Why can't I do it? Don't tell me no. You don't know me. I don't know you. I don't I don't assume to know you. So don't assume to know me. Assume is a sign, assuming is a sign of ignorance. You don't act, you don't treat me like that. I'm sorry to tell you. Don't treat the rest of us like that. Okay, we're our best advocate. You ask us, and if you want to, if you want to do something behind our back, I'm sorry to tell you, we're we're gonna know, we're gonna find out, and you're not gonna keep anything from us. You're just gonna burn our burn our ears a little bit more and make us want to work that much harder. So the more secretive you are, the more people you're gonna get hounding you. So the best way is to keep it open, and you'll get people off your back. But <laughs> you know they don't see the logic in that. They they wanna they wanna talk in riddles and and get their lawyers to draft up stuff and kick us to the curb and try to get us arrested and for you know for voicing what we what we feel is you know a, a universal opinion and multiple you know multiple people multiple states multiple agencies probably agree with us but you know when you know there's got to be some type of oversight and there just isn't so me to be a part of the disability community. This is just something that I feel as though uh, me, you know, I have this old school um, shit kicker attitude, and uh, I don't, I don't take any, and I don't leave any, I don't leave any uh, stuff. I just, we just got to, you know, we can always mediate. We can always find a happy medium where we're all involved, where we're all open, where we're all accountable, and where we can just. Find find some common ground. There's always some way, but you gotta desire to to mediate and desire to come to that common ground. If 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 you walk into a meeting with us and you're already you take one look at us, you size us up and shut us down. Well, no, you're not keeping an open mind. So the objective is to keep an open mind, and I'm trying to, as as a member of the council, m member of the adults and aging and development of disabilities, I want to teach people to be more open-minded and ask for more input from the disability community because there's not enough. As soon as we, as soon as we graduate from high school, uh, we're on our own and I've been lucky because I can go out there and I can ask questions. I'm like, what community-based services are there? You know, DVR, I have vocational rehabilita rehabilitation has still helped me to this day, but I feel as though a lot of people don't have the patience <laughs> that I have either. I'll keep bugging you, keep knocking down doors. A lot of people in my situation I've noticed, um, some that act, can advocate for themselves and some that can't, they get deterred after, you know, the first four or five phone calls isn't returned. Uh, you know, you, you space out a, you know, two week process and it becomes a couple months. You gotta keep calling them. You gotta keep bugging them. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta bug them till they, till they know your name to the point, and they just, they get tired of you. So then they'll finally give in and help you, cause they get tired of hearing it from you. So you gotta, you gotta be, per, you gotta persevere. You gotta keep after it. And if you get, if you get a little deterred, we all do. We all, we all get a little uh, skeptical of the outcome. But you gotta, you know, you gotta keep after it, even if, even if you get a little down. That's just a part of life, man. It's it's part of the cycle. Um, so, you know, you're gonna get down. It's gonna. I know that sounds cliche, but you know, and I don't even think about it that way. I just, you know, I don't even get down anymore. I just know it's a part of the political red tape. You know, I know it's a part of doing business, but uh, you know, there there has to be better oversight, and there isn't. And I hope that I can help help start that help start that trip. Uh, ADA. Oh, I could start. I could start. Uh, you know, uh, from when did it? 1974, right? That's, I think that's when it was. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm I'm a 
I'm a, I'm a 90s baby, but uh, you know, I've I've been around. I've seen the good and bad of it. You know, from from um, from you know the 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 pads on the doors to um, just the, the bathrooms to the the inclusion of kids in the education system and and trying to include them in regular classes and and the development of the IEP programs. There's been so many things that have come about from aid from the from what started as the ADA. Um, the ADA has come leaps and bounds from where it was. Even when I was a young kid going to McClary and going to West Park and and doing and doing all my elementary, it's come a long way. Um, they didn't even have um, uh, automatic door openers uh, when I on, on my um, elementary school building uh, up until I was like in first grade <laughs> so I was one of the main reasons why they threw uh, the keypads on they always saw me wheeling to wheeling up up the ramp and being independent and they saw me having trouble opening the doors I finally said hey man well why don't you just put a keypad on there you know, I was like, I know you can get a tax break for it. Hey, get it, man. Do it. Let's do it. What's the wait? It's, you know, it's boom, boom, boom. Get it done. You know, there, you, you have, you know, just validated. However you get it validated, get it in there. Um, and, and they've it's come a long way, but there's a lot that still needs to still needs to come. There, there needs to be more input, um, more, more input from the from the student or or the individual's level uh, when it comes to just ADA compliance and if something if if something you know from a parking space issue uh, pops up now granted it isn't big because the disability community is small but we have to be able to to be a, there has to be some system uh, so, some some checks and balances type of system where you know everybody's held accountable um, you know there's still not uh, they're still not you know doors aren't still accessible everywhere they should be um, campus you still got to do do things independently now granted that isn't a big issue for me because I have full use of my extremities but again this this is being a part of this council and being a part of the disability community isn't just about me it isn't you know, life just isn't about you, me, the, you know, the other person. It's about us all. It's about working together and helping everybody and loving everybody and, and listening. You can learn a lot just by listening. Don't be ignorant and tune everybody out. Listen. And actually listen and genuinely care. If you listen and genuinely care, you will definitely, uh, you will definitely get, get, get something out of it. And you will learn something from it. And, and really, you know, it, it, it would come a long way and there's just not enough of it. Um, but the ADA, you know, it's, it's come a long way. It has, I see as without the ADA, I wouldn't have been able to be included in uh, normal classes, you know. They probably would have put me in a, a REACH program, a latchkey type program. Uh, luckily, you know, I was able to advocate for myself and I made friends with all my teachers and, and they were uh, they noticed my ability, and they noticed that I was articulate, and they they noticed that I kind of you know always kind of gravitated towards them because I, I'm just old in the mind, you know the way I look at things, um, the way I conduct myself w with people. Um, I try to treat every you know it's cliche, but I was just brought up you know I don't really trust the young kids my age there. Their their motives, their their intentions are different, um, and so me kind of having that analytical sense that I've always had, I've always gravitated towards uh, my my teachers for advocacy, for for you know to to let them know my opinion on something, and then them kind of be my indirect advocate. Um, but again, you know, the ADA has come a long way. Um, there needs to be more of an oversight uh, to include the older buildings, you know, because one of the clauses is, well, if your, your building was built after 1971, 1974, uh, then you don't have to have the ramps, or you don't, or if you do, 
you know, like a small business, like a restaurant, or a, a little small concert venue, or, you know, things that <laughs> we, you and I enjoy because we're all normal people. I'm sorry, we all enjoy music, we all enjoy movies, we all enjoy getting around. I can't, you know, I can't get into old restaurants in old Newcastle. That's a good example. So there has to be some type of inclusion and they need to somehow, you know, have a clause um, in the ADA Act for uh, ADA compliance, for ramps, for curbs, um, because there's been a lot of times even, I'm, I, I do a lot of traveling. Uh, I go around, I go mono skiing out in Utah, I go, you know, I, I'm up in Philly, I go to shows at the Merriam and going around Old City and you got all them curbs, man, and you got all this, you'll, you'll flip right over. Um, and that being a public place, uh, that should fall into some cause where, you know, that needs to be held accountable. Not just because, you know, they, they shouldn't be excluded just because all those buildings, you know, were built, you know, predated the ADA. They, if it's a public place and, you know, it's a restaurant or it's a, it's a venue or it's, it's a, you know, anything um, where, where, you know, basically a normal individual, which I see myself, as a normal individual, because I don't look at myself as Derek with cerebral palsy. I'm Derek George. That's who I am. Yeah, this chair is a part of me. This chair is a part of my daily life. It helps me get around, but past propelling me, <laughs> helping me get around, it's not a part of me. And disability does not define me. Um, and it shouldn't define anyone, because everybody's different. Again, um, so. You know, there has to be some way uh, that the ADA can kind of build on that, and there has to be more oversight, whether it's from the parking, sp parking spots and, and trying to wall people off and maybe getting a ticket. Like, if you see somebody parking that isn't disabled, they can have a disabled placard, but if, if they're parking and, like, a person, with a, a person with a ramp or a lift isn't able to get in, then they should be fined. I don't care because it's so easy to get a handicapped placard now. You could have a bad back and get a placard. You're taking up those spots when, yeah, I understand. So, so such and such person has a bad back, blah, 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 blah. There needs to be more oversight uh, on that at the DMV level from a state level on up to not just hand those placards out because then you're taking those, you're taking those parking spaces away from individuals who need them, from individuals who may drive on their own, who may need that extra couple feet to get in and out of their vehicle safely. If they don't have that space, they could get hit, they could hurt, they could, they could be out in the cold. It could take them an hour, you know, or 20 minutes to load up because they gotta, you know, have somebody else with them. You know, when all this could be avoided just by having clear guidelines in the ADA and more oversight. There's not enough oversight. I, I can't use that word enough. I know it's cliche, but there really isn't because the disability community just doesn't, <laughs> I hate to say this, disability community isn't a big enough money maker for the state legislature. State legislature. Uh, so they're not really going to worry about us. But again, it's not about money. You know, that's fine. If you want to make it about money, that's fine. But you, you also not everything, not every decision has to be made with greed or with money in mind or, or with money as the end goal or some way to scheme. It's about how to make just living better and, and just navigating better. I'm lucky because, you know, if I need to go to the bank, I can just wheel, wheel to the bank. If I got to go to the grocery store, I can wheel up there. But I'm in a college town where, and a small college town at that, where you can get to everything in a reasonable amount of time. In the big cities again, like I said, Old City being a good good example, and Philly being such a big city, yeah, you can get around the subway and public transportation is wonderful. And I've, I've worked up there a few times and getting around is, is good, but getting in and out of restaurants and, and, and drumming and bringing that business in, uh, you know, like we can contribute to any, any small business just like the rest of us. So if you want our money, you know, make make it make you know make it a more welcoming environment, make it a safer environment to where you know disabled individuals aren't aren't afraid to go up a curb 
in fear of uh, in fear of tipping over, in fear of hurting themselves, in fear of injuring others. You know, you could injure others, and so there's a lot of things that need to happen uh, for that to occur. But the ADA has a long way to go. They they've come a long way, but they still have many many years to go. So if you had a magic wand. What of all those things would you do to change the world? If I had a magic wand. <laughs> well, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, any of us can change the world. We can just kind of try to contribute to, to make the world uh, just a more uh, loving place, <laughs> you know, a more open-minded place. I feel, I feel, you know, with the advent of technology, and all this social media and Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook, and we've become a we've become a society of these self-obsessing, self-absorbed individuals who only care about themselves, who only care about the now. They don't think about the future. They don't think about you know ten years from now. They don't think how they can affect change. All they care about is you know the the newest song that came out or the newest newest video that came out, so the point is, if I could wave a magic wand and change anything, there's not really much, <laughs> there's a lot I'd want to change, from politics on down, from the way that people look at, look at individuals like myself, um, you know, I, I would hope that if anybody hears this interview, stop looking at us and looking at the chair and looking at it as an obstacle. Come and talk to us first, it's ignorant for you to, to think that. I understand everybody has their assumptions, but you know, just come and speak with us and come keep an open mind. You'd be surprised uh, what some of us have to offer. Um, so if there's one thing I could change, it's, it's the, the selfishness within our, our, new, uh, our new kind of generation we have here with all this advent of technology where it's just constant stimulation. You, you need, they, you know, we all, all these kids, you know, it's constant stimulation, they want this constant reward system to just, oh, that next like, that next this on Snapchat, to get away from that. Start working on yourself and start opening your mind up and listening. Listen more and don't just, you know, observe from afar and with your selfish motives in mind. If you can observe from afar, ask questions, not take anything for face value and, like I said, just keep an open mind and treat everybody the same, it's, it's very easy. It's very easy. So if somebody was going to do your uh, autobiography, or your biographies, your obituary, whatever, what would you want people in the future to know about you? Uh, well, what would, I, what would I want people in the future to know about me? Well, that I was a person, uh, honestly, you know, I, I, I've always, I've always said this, and I'll say this probably till the day I die, because it's also one of my downfalls, <laughs> and it's with women, with with friends, especially with women. I hate to say it, <laughs> take advantage of it a lot, but you know, I always would put everybody else before myself, um, and and the fact is, it's like you have to constantly be learning. Every day you learn. Take the good with the bad. You keep learning. If something bad happens to you, don't cry about it. Don't bitch about it. Just just work through it. It it was there to teach you. It's there to teach you a lesson. It's there to 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 help you grow. So you grow every day. You learn every day. Keep an open mind and love everyone. <laughs>